I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, U.S. stocks close at yet another record high, with tech driving the longest rally for the S&P since February. We'll track the record run on Bloomberg. Plus, Europe's big vote on forcing big tech to limit the spread of hate and terror propaganda via social media. We are live in London with the latest. And Amazon opens its first Manhattan bookstore. Why the e-commerce giant could be late to the brick-and-mortar game. First, to our lead, U.S. stocks reaching fresh records. The S&P 500 index pushing its longest rally since February and closing the day up half a percent. And the tech sector continues to be one of the strongest performers. Take a look in the Bloomberg. You'll see the white line here, which represents tech well above the S&P 500 since President Trump took office. For more on the tech sector, Keith Raboy, partner at Coastal Ventures, who's invested in the payments company Stripe, Airbnb, as well as Lyft. He's also the founder of of the real estate company Open Door, which we'll talk about in a moment. Great to have you back on the show. Pleasure First to be all. here. So Silicon Valley was largely anti-Trump, and now we have tech stocks reaching record highs. And I wonder, what is the real impact of Trump going to be on tech, and is it going to be so bad? Well, I don't think anybody really knows yet. I think the Trump policies are a little bit inchoate even in their own mind in the White House, what are those policies, which of them are gonna get through the Congress. So I think it's gonna take a while to sort out um, which policies hurt and which ones retard um, tech, which, which ones help. Like, so some tax reform can be very helpful, some immigration policies may hurt tech, but it's unclear what that sort is. And right now, basically, the tech companies are just continuing to have software eat the world, and the market's appreciating how much software is eating the world. You saw the news about Ford. There's just more and more manifestations. It's going to happen in healthcare, where technology, software, AI, machine learning changes the way every American lives. Of all the possible effects, which one are you most concerned about or watching the most closely? Well, I think we absolutely need tax reform. We are not competitive in many ways compared to other uh, markets, other countries. And in the global economy where our, comp where our companies that are founded here and headquartered here have to compete, if we have an uncompetitive regulatory structure and if we have an uncompetitive tax regime, that's eventually going to cause real problems. And I think one of the reasons why tech stocks are you know, going through the roof is that there is an expectation that at a minimum we're going to see some tax reform. You're longtime friends with Peter Thiel, and I know you talk. What insight can you share into the administration? Uh, well, I'm not going to share any conversations I've had with Peter directly. Um, I think, like many people, uh, I would say my views are pretty typical, which is let's watch what happens. Let's see if he can deliver on some of the promises to clean up the mess that is Washington. I think Peter's views are basically that Washington politics are broken which many people in Silicon Valley would agree with. And if they're so broken, sometimes the only way to fix something is to start from scratch in kind of in a revolutionary way. Now, when you, do, when you engage in a revolution, things can get worse. Like in France, the revolution wasn't particularly positive. Mm -hmm. A lot of people like lost, you know, <laughs> lost their lives. So there, there's a bit of when you have disruption, disruption can cut in many unpredictable ways. And I think everybody's sitting back, including Peter, to see what happens. But I think Peter is basically saying the status quo is unacceptable. And eventually, more and more people would agree with that. Um, whereas many people who voted for the incumbents, like Hillary, let's say, wanted more of the status quo. And Peter's basically saying, we've got to stop this. And at some point, taking, rolling the dice and taking more risk is better than continuing the status quo for eternity. So let's talk about a risk you're taking with Open Door. Uh, this is an idea that you've apparently had for a very long time. You offer homeowners a price to sell their home basically immediately, and yep. you help them close in a matter of days. You've raised a lot of money. Is this is success contingent on the markets keeping up? You know, are, are, is, is a blow up possible here? The New York Times uh, recently called it a fat startup. Um, you know, are you one step away from potential catastrophe if things don't go right? Well, I think it's true for all startups that you're always one step away from potential ca catastrophe, <laughs> whether you're Tesla or SpaceX or Open Door. But I think we've thought through very carefully the effects of a macro market correction in real estate. So we buy president, uh, res primary residential real estate. We give people offers in 30 seconds or less so they can instantly sell their home just like they trade in their car today. What we've thought through is though people will generally 
value our product and service more in a downturn than in an appreciating market because effectively people crave liquidity. Mm -hmm. And right now in a hot market like say San Francisco, it's easy to get liquidity for your house. You just put up a sign and someone's gonna offer to buy it. But in a down market, the buyers disappear and we might be the only buyer and we're a great source of people providing liquidity. So we've obviously studied 2008 carefully. We actually would do quite well in a 2008 environment, but nobody really knows what's gonna be the next black swan. The kind of thing that it would affect us would move residential real estate prices by two, three, four, five percent in one month. And what, what macroeconomic shock causes that is very unpredictable. And so that is very difficult to model. SoftBank just raised almost $100 billion to invest in tech. How does this change the competition for you as a VC, and could this lead to another bubble? I mean, are there that many companies to invest that much money? Well, they're investing mostly in kind of growth opportunities. Mm -hmm. We do at Coastal Ventures, we're a venture capitalist firm in the sense of we take seed stage risk, series A risk, sometimes series B, but never we're, we're never providing growth capital to companies. So I don't think it really impacts us. It may be a good um, source of capital for some of our best companies. Like you may have seen Rocket Lab put a you know satellite um, live you know today for the first time launch a satellite and it's going to be able to deliver low-cost satellites as efficiently as maybe flying a plane. And so those kind of companies need to raise more money. And SoftBank's Vision Fund may be a great source of capital for high growth companies, including Open Door in the future. So you don't think this could lead to another bubble in the making? Well, it could. I mean, obviously, too much capital chasing very few great ideas and awesome founders does create distortions. And we sort of saw that in 2014 and 15, whereas in 2016 and 17, the market's kind of stabilized for the most part. And so there are only so many great founders. Building a company from beginning to, um, like let's say a scalable business that's permanent is a heroic exercise. And there's not that many heroes in the world. Once you get the machine working and have figured out the business equation, then there's a lot more people that can run a machine. But building that machine is a very rare, a very rarefied skill. And so I don't I don't think throwing more capital at that process necessarily is good for every anybody in the process. SoftBank has invested in Didi, Uber, Lyft, Rival. Uh, you are a Lyft investor. Uber has had many challenges, as we know. Do you think that if the ride-sharing market isn't winner-take-all, that Uber still gets most, or how much of the U.S. market is really up for grabs? It's a good question. I've been, you know, on the show for three, four, five years I talking, know I talking about, about Lyft time, and Uber, but it and I made the same consistent point. I think, which is that it's not a winner-take-all market. That if you can have liquidity, meaning like a, a user, a consumer, or a normal person can get a ride in three to four minutes. They don't really care what service they're using for the most part. Now, getting to liquidity in a particular market takes effort. So, but if Lyft can provide a three or four or five minute wait, just like Uber can, users are just price sensitive and maybe a little brand sensitive in, in today's world. And that's the primary decision. So I don't think it's a winner take all market at all. All right, Keith Raboy, General Partner, Coastal Ventures, you are sticking with me. Staying with Lyft, it's looking to court more customers as the ride-hailing competition remains red hot, as Keith said. On the heels of the delete Uber movement, Lyft is rolling out a black car service for customers looking for more luxury in their ride. The new offerings called Lyft Lux and Lyft Lux SUVs in five cities and will expand to 20 this summer. It'll include options for riders to book a Tesla, BMW, or another premium car. Coming up, from blocking hate speech to accessing encrypted data, authorities in Europe are stepping up regulations around tech in the wake of the terror attack in Manchester this week. We'll discuss what happens next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. Appian is the latest enterprise tech company to begin trading on the public market with a $75 million IPO, following in the footsteps of Cloudera, MuleSoft, Okta, Yext. Shares surged as high as 34% earlier today, closing at 25%. Appian Software helps over 280 clients, including Goldman Sachs and Sprint, build apps without needing extensive knowledge on how to code. Earlier today, Bloomberg's IPO reporter Alex Barinka spoke exclusively with CEO Matt Calkins and asked about taking the company public versus staying private in this current environment.
Staying private for longer works perfectly if all you want out of the event is money. You can get it through the private market and there's a lot more private equity available. But if you want publicity, if you want to be a greater force in local recruiting like we do, or if you want to make more partnerships and stronger ones with global systems integrators like we do, then nothing really duplicates the kind of legitimacy that you get from going public. As I said this morning when I spoke at NASDAQ, we're here to raise the curtain on the era of low code. And I couldn't do that if I was just making a private equity transaction. Uh, I, I have to make a statement in the public markets in order to get people thinking there's a new way to build software. Next time I may build it on a platform. Where exactly do you feel like uh, this bit of extra money is going to help you out? Well, I'm really excited about Europe. You know, we put down a new organization in Europe, a, a, a new leadership, new offices, and a, it's got an opportunity to really break out. So we are out of our office in London. We're, we're running a, a lot of uh, new sales reps. We got an office in Australia. I'm excited about going to different places around the world since we're still highly concentrated in North America. But sales is generally the biggest thing we're going to spend money on, though we'll do a little bit more marketing. And of course, the purpose of the IPO for us, because we didn't really need the money, is to raise the profile on the low-code concept. Let's keep the focus on Europe now. Facebook has been stepping up its efforts to combat hate speech for years using different techniques around the globe, and most recently hiring 3,000 people to monitor and flag content. Meantime, stricter regulations are popping up in Europe. The European Parliament set to vote on proposals that would require Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to block videos containing hate speech and incitements to terrorism. Here now to discuss what may come next, Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde live from London. Keith Raboy still with me here in the studio from Coastal Ventures. So Caroline, first of all, set the stage for us. How are the regulations in Europe different than they are in the United States? Well, they've been talking a lot tougher. I mean, even in terms of bang for your buck or bang for your euro, because in Germany, they're even saying, look, we will fine you social media outlets, Facebook included, some 50 million euros if within 24 hours you are not removing the hate speech or indeed the insightful videos that might be pointing towards extremist or, or terrorist-related activities. If you don't pull them down within 24 hours, you could be fined 50 million euros. And indeed, your executives could be fined 5 million euros a pop. So Germany has really led the charge ever since we look back to 2015 really when the immigration crisis when people from many a different country particularly Syria and Afghanistan came to Germany and this really incited a lot of hate speech at the time that actually saw people then congregating going out and struck violence to its heart this got Germany active France did the same we heard from France and the representatives of the social media giants meeting that was back in 2015 after they had some deadly attacks and now in the UK we're hearing the same sort of calls calling on Twitter on Facebook to say be quicker at taking down this sort of insightful hate related content we need you to in the wake of the Manchester terror attacks now Keith Facebook says it reviews hundred million pieces of content every month is the scope of this problem just too big for them to deal with I think to manually review every piece of content absolutely is too big. I mean, there's a billion users per day or whatever there is and, you know, X number of posts, and I think that's unreasonable. Can you use math and algorithms to prioritize um, a very narrow set that need to be reviewed? I think that's a scalable, you know, approach and that can work very well. And I think they understand it very well, how to combine math and machines, uh, math, math and machines with people in an efficient way. And I think they'll be, they're pretty, they actually are better than they get credit for at it and they'll be increasingly better. So you're optimistic about the crack down on hate speech around fake news? No. Um, so I think there's very different things. I think mm. fake news is actually a fake problem. Mm. And then I think... What do you mean by that? I don't believe there's any evidence that suggests that the average American, let's say, knew less in the last election about politics, policies, political figures than at any time in American history. I think, if, if anything, the evidence is the contrary. People are more informed than ever before. So I don't think, and in, secondarily, I think fake news is an excuse that a lot of people use who used to be gatekeepers to filter views and opinions. And they want to get, insert themselves back into the process of having a role of filtering. And the internet as a whole has eliminated the role of gatekeepers and third parties in terms of filtering, and that's not stoppable. So I think that the fake news is a politically charged politically biased approach um, to constraining a set of opinions. I think hate speech is well defined in, in the United States is generally defined fairly narrowly and in Europe much more broadly. I think in the United States it would be very difficult to get co tech companies to comply with laws passed by parliament or some 
you know, regulatory regime because we have a very broad protection of the First Amendment that doesn't apply in Europe. And so the definitions of hate speech and incitement to terrorism or violence are much broader and much more wide than would ever be possible here uh, to, to prevent. Caroline, fake news or misinformation or whatever you want to call it was an issue following the Manchester terror attack. Now the UK government is pushing Parliament to pass a law that would require Facebook to basically remove encry encryption on WhatsApp messages belonging mm -hmm. to suspects in investigations. Tell us the latest on this. Yeah, this is fascinating and of course a bit of deja vu to the San Bernardino attacks in the United States. The same call is here that the United Kingdom the Conservative Party, which looks, which looks like it could well win by a landslide in the general election come June the 8th, they're calling for potentially the encryption that you have on WhatsApp, which is owned by Facebook, to the, be basically a backdoor created, as was called after the San Bernardino shooting in the US, to allow the authorities to access the data of those they believe are related to terrorist incidents. Now, it's interesting how this is all being digested by the United Kingdom at the moment because many feel after the atrocities that occurred on Monday night in Manchester that yes, it would be a good idea if we could ensure that those who have lethal views and might indeed use them can be accessed their data. Now, I, Rohan Silver, he's a big name in the UK tech community. He helped found Tech City with the previous Prime Minister, David Cameron, he was one of those saying, look, actually, maybe this isn't a bad idea because in the United Kingdom, what it would be is a judge asking in specific circumstances to access the data of certain individuals. He says, look, maybe that's not a bad idea, tech companies. Maybe you need to step up to the mark here. We're not asking for a blanket backdoor to be allowed, not allowed encryption to be eroded for all of us. But when it's needed by a judge, that could be the case. How should Keith, the tech companies approach these issues? Should they remove encryption uh, in cases like this? Well, I think it's a little bit more complicated. So first of all, it's always been the case for 300 years that if you go to a judge, you can get a warrant to search your house. Someone's always been able to get a warrant to go through all of your papers, all your belongings, your computers, everything at home. So the idea of applying the same principles to your phone is pretty trivial and not shouldn't be that controversial. The issue in the United States that a lot of people in the tech community have brought, uh, sort of published and broadcast is that once you create a backdoor, it's not clear that the government can constrain it and keep it in the right people's hands and that the wrong people don't all of a sudden have access to everybody's data. And that's like a technical argument. Is it possible to have a secure way to unencrypt things that can only be used by a very small number of people? Mm. And historic history sort of suggests maybe not. Mm. And math sort of suggests maybe not. So there's a danger that people are worried about. But the concept of a judge ordering access to data is, should be uncontroversial. This is a much longer conversation that I know we could all speak uh, for hours about. Uh, Keith Raboy, General Partner at Coastal Ventures, thanks so much for sticking with us. Caroline Hyde in London, thanks so much for that reporting. Coming up, Intel is trying to carve out space in the competitive world of VR. We'll hear from an Intel executive next. This is Bloomberg. Intel has been making strides in gaming and VR for years, but the space is crowded with competition. The company is now rolling out a new range of high-end chips with a lot of applications in computing, but gaming as well. I spoke with Frank Soqui, Intel's general manager for gaming and virtual reality, about the announcement and how it can serve customers. Before, you would have to do maybe just play a game or just edit one video stream. What this lets you do is really do things that we call megatasking. So give me, I'll give you an example in a game. I can play the game. Without interrupting the gameplay, I can store the game for later editing, and I can stream it live. And then you add yet another workload like uh, VR on top of that, and that means my game is very, very responsive, and I'm doing all of these other things at the same time. So not multitasking, megatasking. Megatasking. Never heard that yeah. before. So is this a response to what AMD has done? How much performance do you think you'll have over them? You know, uh, we are always focused on the end user and the, uh, the customers that we serve. And we've been dedicated to extreme edition processors for like 10 years. So this isn't because of any recent activity by anybody else. This is because of our commitment to delivering the best gaming experience, the best content creation experience, the best overclocking experience to our customers. And every year that we do that, again and again, they, they, they love what we provide and they, they'll buy that all day long. Now, in terms of VR, you have several collaborations going on, but we're curious about what products are actually in the pipeline. What's coming to market? 
what type of products, gaming yeah. products. So the products are actually more focused on gaming than anything else right now, although the overclockers and the, the do-it-yourself crowd is an, a very big part of our market. So a lot of people like to build their own rigs, their own gaming systems, or their own higher performance uh, uh, platforms. Now, Intel has been at VR and gaming for a while. Uh, you've also got competitors there, NVIDIA, for example. What are you doing to get ahead? So when we think about what's happening at the high end of the gaming market, it takes crazy awesome performance on the CPU side. It also includes a lot of platform elements. So we have things like Optane technology. And what goes in conjunction with high-end gaming systems are discrete graphics cards. So there's a couple of discrete graphics cards vendors, and that's, that's fine for that part of the market as well. We've talked a lot about when will VR go mainstream, and it seems there's just not enough content mm. ready to do that. I mean, when is this going to happen? Is this actually going to happen? So what I actually say VR is happening actually right now, when you say is it happening, we've actually invested in uh, some AAA content to make sure that we can show the case Core i7 and Core i9 above Core i5 with visual differentiation. I think what you say by mainstream is when do we get sort of this tipping point where everybody's going to want to do VR? So you need that compelling content. And to be honest, what we're doing with Microsoft is actually working to develop that kind of content for that mixed reality environment. That was Intel General Manager for Virtual Reality and Gaming Group, Frank Soki. Still ahead, the impact technology is having on our labor force now and 20 years out. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie Slaughter next. And a feature I just want to bring to your attention, our new interactive TV function. You can find it at TVGo on the Bloomberg. You can check us out live. If you miss an interview, you can go back and check it out. You can send our producers a message. You can ask me a question. Play along with the charts we bring to you on air. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Just check it out at TVGo. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. Home searches in Manchester and across the UK are revealing important clues in a fast-moving investigation into the concert bombing that killed 22 people. That is according to Manchester's police chief, who also says the eight arrests made so far are significant. U.S. intelligence may now have to guarantee the Brits there will be no more leaks to the media after photos detailing the bomb and the name of the suspect were first published in the U.S. President Trump has asked the DOJ to launch a complete review. President Trump and French President Emmanuel Macron engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat of sorts in Brussels. Both men locked hands for what seemed like an eternity before President Trump seemed ready to pull away. Macron evidently wasn't and held on a little longer. Trump has called handshakes barbaric in the past. Former Greek Prime Minister Lucas Papademos was wounded today in Athens after opening an envelope that contained an explosive device in his car. That is according to a Greek police spokeswoman. The, the injuries are non-life-threatening. South Africa's Jacob Zuma faces a key battle for his political survival this weekend. Senior members of his ruling ANC party plan to push its decision-making National Executive Committee to order him to step down. Zuma is also facing an unprecedented lack of support from the public. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Thursday in Washington, 7.30 Friday morning in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Paul, we had uh, some records here on Wall Street. Yeah, that's right. But we do have ASX futures off a little, about three points uh, this morning. And we'll be watching the oil space after that oil price fell. So uh, the oil producers locally, Woodside, Oil Search, Origin could be impacted by that. That's after OPEC uh, extended its output cuts as expected, but failed to provide a timetable beyond that. Uh, elsewhere, Nikkei futures are showing modest gains. That's the futures traded out of Chicago anyway. Uh, we're waiting on CPI out of Japan for April, looking for a gain there of four tenths of one percent, an improvement on the March figure, and that follows on for those good GDP numbers we've been seeing coming out of Japan recently. Uh, Air Asia is one stock to watch in the region that trades out of Malaysia. This is after net profit fell to $62 million. That was mainly because of uh, a slump in first quarter profit from the long haul carrier Air Asia X. Also watching out today for GDP out of Taiwan. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Let's get back to our top story this hour. U.S. stocks reached new records with the three major averages closing at new all-time highs and the S&P 500 extending its longest winning streak since February. Tech stocks helped push the S&P 500 to a six-day rally. Netflix, Google, Microsoft, and Amazon all hit new benchmarks. Google and Amazon are inching closer to the $1,000 per share price tag. But it's not all good news. GameStop shares dropping after hours as much as 7 percent. The company reported earnings that showed weaker than expected software sales and lowered its guidance. The digital revolution is transforming the world of work, with the latest technological advancing placing some jobs on the chopping block. With that in mind, the new think tank, the think tank New America released the Commission on Work, Workers and Technology, which is done in partnership with Bloomberg's T Bloomberg TV's parent company, Bloomberg LP. The report concluded that it's very difficult to predict whether there will be more or less work to go around as a result of technology, but outlined four future workplace scenarios that could play out in the next 10 to 20 years. Earlier, we spoke with Anne-Marie Slaughter, president and CEO of New America, former director of policy planning under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton from Princeton, New Jersey. We started by asking about the workforce trends she expects to be givens in the future. Well, I think we know some things are given. We know there'll be some amount of automation. We just don't know how much. We also know that there's a shift going on from jobs to tasks or, or things like in the gig economy. Again, we just don't know how much. So our scenarios run through uh, different combinations of jobs and uh, more, le more or fewer jobs and whether the, that will be more jobs or more tasks. So what did you learn about what the technology technology industry doesn't understand about government and vice versa. <laughs> Yes, this was in many ways a Washington meets California uh, project uh, where, uh, you know, I think the, the tech industry is often, you know, let's ask forgiveness rather than permission. Uh, Washington is much more, look, you have to think about the public interest as a whole. So one of the most interesting interactions, for instance, would, was between union leaders and actually faith leaders and tech startup uh, entrepreneurs where where the entrepreneurs were talking about this great technology and other people in the room were saying, yes, but what happens to the workers whose jobs will be lost? Even if there are more jobs created overall, it won't be jobs for them. What do we do about that? And that's often government's job. Now, you work for Secretary Clinton at the State Department, and many have said you would have a key post in the administration had she won. What kind of an impact do you think President Trump will have on the future of jobs for better or for worse? I don't think President Trump himself, or had it been a President Clinton, would have been able to actually control the future of work. Again, those are market forces, they're technology forces, they're human forces. What I do think is critical is that the government think about things like portable benefits and, frankly, uh, really good health care, because only when, if we have the ability to move your retirement and your health care wherever you go, rather than tying it to your job, will we be able to uh, take advantage of the technology and the economy that's coming? Are Facebook and Google too powerful when it comes to political affairs? Do you see them abusing their power down the line? I think one of the things we think about when we look at the future of work uh, are that, that what the economy looks like now uh, is, is not likely to stay the same for the coming decades. If you go back to the late 19th century and you look at the power of railroads and big oil companies, uh, big steel companies, uh, sooner or later the uh, citizens and smaller business demanded uh, more of a share of the market. Uh, and I, I think even though Google and Facebook and Amazon, uh, other big tech companies offer extraordinary benefits, uh, the public as, as a whole is going to want to find more ways to share in those benefits. As a longtime foreign policy expert, I'm curious for your thoughts on Facebook and Twitter and their responsibility when it comes to fake news, and especially your thoughts on you know, Russia potentially meddling in U.S. affairs via cyberspace. 
Well, the, the Russian meddling in the U.S. election was an act of aggression, right? It really, uh, Putin seeks to destabilize our democracy, and we can now see that he has done that in, in a whole lot of different ways, through meddling with the presidential campaign, through hacking, uh, through, through putting out fake news. Uh, one of the challenges for Facebook and Twitter and for all of us is that when the public square is privately owned, then of course there has to be some sharing of responsibility. Now, your article, Anne-Marie, Why Women Still Can't Have It All, will probably live on forever in the cultural zeitgeist. I'm curious if the conversation since and the rise of the lean-in movement has led you to reconsider anything that you wrote there. I think th I, I have not reconsidered. My original claim was that work uh, has to change as much as people have to change. I actually think Sheryl Sandberg agrees with that, uh, and uh, I don't think that there was nearly as much of a gap as people uh, imagined. But what I do believe very strongly now, and that I wrote in my book Unfinished Business, is we have to think about this not as a women's issue, but a care issue. This is for all people who care for for children, for parents, for spouses, for siblings. Our society makes it very hard to combine earning an income and caring for others. And if we want to exploit the talent of our society, if we want to harness the, the growth and potential of our citizens, we have to acknowledge that most workers also now have caregiving responsibilities, not just women, uh, and make room for those uh, responsibilities and support them. That was Anne-Marie Slaughter, president and CEO of New America. Famous Harvard dropout, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg returned to the university Thursday to deliver its commencement speech. Zuckerberg told graduates that they need to help others find purpose in a world where machines are taking jobs and communities aren't as stable. You are graduating at a time when this is especially important. When our parents graduated, that sense of purpose reliably came from your job, your church, your community. But today, technology and automation are eliminating many jobs. Membership in a lot of communities has been declining, and a lot of people are feeling disconnected and depressed and are trying to fill a void in their lives. The comments come as he travels to the U.S. to understand what Facebook users feel about the social network and the country after the presidential election revealed deep divides. Zuckerberg is the youngest person to deliver a commencement speech at Harvard and was given an honorary degree for the effort. A new vision for fitness powered by technology. We'll take a look at a new app that aims to help you stay in shape by taking data to the next level. That is next. This is Bloomberg. The spinning industry continues to grow, so much so that Peloton has become a tech unicorn. Peloton bikes go for about $2,000, but investors are betting that this is a billion-dollar opportunity. After closing a $325 million Series E funding round, the company is valued at $1.25 billion. Investors in the company include GGV Capital, Comcast, NBC Universal, and Kleiner Perkins. Staying with the fitness industry, in the U.S. alone, people spend $30 billion annually on health and fitness clubs, according to one research firm. One company with plans to swipe a chunk of that market is Gixo, launching a new personalized fitness app to the public today. Gixo raised $3.7 million in funding led by Greylock Partners. LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman has joined the board. Gixo co-founder Selena Tobakawala joins me now here in the studio. And you also, 20 years ago, founded Evite. Uh, and the story goes that you got back together with your Evite co-founder, Al, from 20 years ago to start this new company. What was it like getting the band back together? <laughs> so yeah, Al and I started Evite over 20 years ago. And we've stayed super close friends since. And when we were thinking about starting a company, what we really wanted to think about was an area that we were both passionate in, and health and fitness was definitely that. So you could have done anything. Why fitness? So whenever you're starting a company, I think there's a few factors that come into play. Number one, is it something you're personally passionate about? Number two, is the market big enough? And number three, can you create disruption? 
And health and fitness was something we were very personally passionate about. As you and I both know, unfortunately, two years ago, Dave, my founder and CEO of um, SurveyMonkey, passed away. And for me, that was motivating to start thinking about how can I use tech to change health and wellness. Um, the second piece is the market, which you already covered. There's $30 billion a year spent on gyms, and most of that goes unused. Um, and the third is, is like, is this something that you can disrupt? And so Al and I, as founders do, we put on our exercise clothes and we went and tried a bunch of different experiences. And the ones that are the most retentive are things like Orange Theory, Soul Cycle, and Berries. And what those have are live music, awesome coaches, and a really engaged community. But on the other hand, they're pretty cost prohibitive to most people. And as somebody who is definitely not fit, it's pretty intimidating to walk into those places. And so what we realized is we could use technology and build an app that gave people the great coaching, mm -hmm. live music, a totally engaged community, but at the same time was affordable, accessible, and available for people with all different fitness levels. So I was gonna mention the competition, but you did it for me. <laughs> However, you are asking for precious time, workout time, and, and money from people. What makes you think you can stand out from all of these other options? So we think that the idea of being live is really, really important because you have, when you ask consumers, why don't you exercise today, you always get two answers, time and motivation. I mean, you can relate to that, like two kids, you know, the only time I exercised for five and a half years was walking from my car to the train station. And so when we were thinking about Gixo, we were thinking, how do we attack these problems really head on? Um, and for motivation, we think that live aspect is key, where you have coaches that are pushing you along, saying, Emily, you can make it up that hill. Um, and you have this engaged community where people can encourage each other and support each other during the class. And then the convenience is key. I mean, there was a research article the New York Times put out and they said that even if you're two miles closer to your gym, you're more likely to exercise. We are trying to bring through the mobile phone that convenience with you anytime, anywhere. I mean, I did a 15 minute class this morning before my kids woke up. Amazing. Uh, how are consumers and millennials though changing how they work out? Is this what they want? So we think that we do target a pretty broad demographic. Mm -hmm. We're not just focused on millennials. I mean, we have our, in our beta test, it's been a lot of professionals, moms, um, people that are busy. With, with millennials, the pieces that we, they do enjoy are the community aspect and some of the classes that are a little bit more competitive. As you mentioned earlier, you were number two at SurveyMonkey, Dave's CTO for a very long time. I'm curious what you learned there that you're applying here. <laughs> I, I know he had a profound impact on you as he did on Silicon Valley. Um, I can't really summarize at the mass amounts I learned from Dave, but what I can say is that one of the most important things was how to build a great company and how to build a great culture of a company. And so literally on the very first day when we were starting our company, the first thing Al and I did was list out what do we want the culture of the company to be. Mm -hmm. On that note, you were a candidate to become CEO of SurveyMonkey. You are technical, you're a founder, What's it going to take to get more women in the C-suite in Silicon Valley? So I think with SurveyMonkey, you know, they ended up in a great place with Xander and now adding some amazing board members. Serena Williams. <laughs> and so, um, but I think that if you think about the problem in general, there is no question there's not enough women in the C-suite, there's not enough women on boards. But, you know, thinking like an engineer, whenever there's a problem, the first thing you have to do is recognize there's a problem. And I feel like people like you have done a great job of bringing to the forefront that there is a problem in Silicon Valley. So that's the first thing. Thing, is the second thing is how do you solve the problem and you know I can't answer that for everybody I mean for myself that's part of the reason that I'm you know building Gixo I want to build a great company that inspires other women to be founders and that we can do it all right Selena Tabakawala founder of Gixo and Evite back in the day thank you so much thank for joining you us. <laughs> have you here on the show Music streaming service Spotify has appointed four new directors to the board. This according to a person familiar with the matter. The move is said to be aimed at strengthening corporate governance ahead of a planned U.S. listing. The Stockholm-based company's nominations include execs from Chinese electric car maker Next EV, 
YouTube, and Disney's former COO Tom Staggs. The addition of Staggs brings further entertainment industry expertise to the board, which previously added Netflix chief content officer Ted Sarandos. Spotify is understood to be looking at expanding its video offerings. Target is investing $75 million in startup Casper Sleep, the online mattress seller. This according to people familiar with the situation, who say it's part of a bid to expand its e-commerce presence while brick and mortar sales decline. Target reportedly considered a bid for the entire business. A spokesman confirmed the investment, but declined to comment on the amount. Coming up, e-commerce giant Amazon is back at it with brick and mortar this time. We'll take you inside the company's first bookstore in New York City next. This is Bloomberg. Amazon just opened two grocery pickup ki kiosks in Seattle, part of its latest effort to enter the $800 billion grocery market and compete with click and collect shopping options from competitors like Walmart. The Amazon Fresh Pickup spots let shoppers buy groceries online and pick them up in as little as 15 minutes rather than having them delivered to their homes. It's a feature that's available if you're an Amazon Prime member. Grocery sales have been slow to shift online, unlike books and electronics, leaving Amazon at a disadvantage to competitors which is why the tech giant is experimenting with brick and mortar concepts. And Amazon continues to open brick and mortar bookstores around the country. The most recent can be found on the west side of Manhattan. Bloomberg Gadfly, Shira Ovide took a trip to check out the newest bookstore on the block. Amazon helped kill bookstore chains, and now it's trying to become one. The company since 2015 has been opening a handful of physical bookstores in places like Seattle, San Diego, and Chicago, and it just opened its seventh location in an upscale mall in New York City. People aren't moving away from buying physical books. We sell a lot of physical books on Amazon.com, and we wanted to give them a new way to discover books. You know, the desire to find a book you love is a desire that is very common, and we felt like we could make it easier, make it more delightful for customers in the physical space. All the books in the store are bestsellers or rated four stars or above by Amazon's online book buyers. There are sections for books that large numbers of people have added to their Amazon wish lists online. And there are no prices listed on the book titles. You can open the Amazon app on your phone and scan the book cover to get a price or take the book to a scanning station inside the store. But Amazon is also using its bookstores to get people to bring more of Amazon into their homes. There's a big section for people to test drive the company's gadgets, like the Kindle Fire TV box to stream web videos to your TV. There are also Kindle e-readers, Amazon's line of voice-activated home speakers called the Echo, and other home electronics. Customers have asked for it. Customers want to try it out. They want to see, what does a smart home look like? What can I do to make my home smarter? How does the Amazon Music interact with the Echo? How, what, is, what kinds of things can I ask Alexa? They want to see it in person, and they want to talk to, talk to um, experts about it. And so we have brought that into the store. It's still not exactly clear why Amazon is bothering with physical stores at all. Its website is already the biggest bookseller in the world, and the popularity of shopping for books and much more on Amazon.com has crushed bookstore chains like Barnes & Noble and Borders, which went out of business a few years ago. Amazon doesn't disclose sales in its handful of stores, but it's probably a tiny fraction of the company's $140 billion in annual revenue. And just one final note of irony here. Before Borders went belly up, it had a bookstore in the very same mall that's now home to Amazon's books. That was Bloomberg Gadfly's Shira Ovide. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. On Friday's show, we will hear from improbable CEO Herman Narula, the London-based virtual reality startup that got $502 million in investment money from SoftBank, one of the largest ever VC deals in the UK. And Bloomberg Tech is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.